Lord, I greet the saints of God in the ever-living and ever-loving, always giving and faithfully forgiving name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may, you may not be able to type in the chat, amen, but you can audibly proclaim and exclaim, amen. Second Samuel chapter 18, verse number 33. Second Samuel chapter 18, verse number 33. That's where we are this morning. The New International Version of the Bible declares, the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom. My son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Can you see and sense the sadness, the sorrow and the suffering of King David? This moment in David's life truly is a depiction and a reflection of the change that has occurred in David. He's not the same man you saw relaxing on the rooftop of his palace. He's not the same man you saw looking with lust as Bathsheba bathed. He's not the same man you saw committing the crime of adultery and murder. He's not the same man you saw staying silent when Amnon, his firstborn, had raped his half-sister, who remained silent when Tamar, his beautiful daughter, was the victim of that rape. This is not the same man you saw who kept silent when Absalom, his other son, had executed revenge by murdering Amnon. David has changed because of his repentance his arrogance has given way to humility. Psalm chapter 51 was not merely David's way of paying God lip service. David's penitent plea and candid confession for God to forgive him of his transgression, iniquity and sin is heard not only through his words, but it's confirmed in his actions. When Absalom had rebelled and had crowned himself as king in Hebron, knowing this was in competition and in opposition to himself, David decided to depart to Jerusalem. You can observe his humility for yourself. Just watch and witness how this deposed and dethroned king cares more about the will of God and the well-being of others more than his own wellness or welfare. For he could have stayed on his throne in his palace in Jerusalem, but instead he leaves the glory of his own throne. He leaves the comfort of his own palace. He leaves the safety of his own city. As David flees the persecution of his son Absalom, every action of David all along the way reveals his humility. For he could have commanded that Ittai and his soldiers join him and protect him as he fled Jerusalem. Uh, he, could have, he, he could have commanded them, he could have instructed them, but instead he tries to persuade them to not risk their safety for his security. David is a changed man. He could have instructed Zadok and all the Levites to bring the Ark of the Covenant of God with them. This sacred symbol would have appeared as an advantage and an asset to David and all his followers. It would have served as a handicap and a hindrance for Absalom and all his followers. But David's priority is putting God in his rightful place. David is a changed man. For he had laid aside his royal and regal garments and had ascended the Mount of Olives barefoot and with a covered head. As he reached the summit of the Mount, he looked back at Jerusalem, God's habitation, God's holy city, and he cried out to God. And just as he had ascended the Mount of Olives, David's prayers now ascend to God. Just as David had laid down his regalia, his prayers are now laid before God's holy throne. I don't know what David prayed that day, but I know how he felt. For his faith had found a resting place. 
And so he focused now not on what he had done in his past, for he had already been forgiven. His focal point was not on his faults, flaws, or failures. That was all behind him, but he fixed his eyes on the one who had forgiven him and who knows the future. And so David would move forward in faith. And there's a preaching point right there that when you're driving, it's dangerous to always be looking in your rear view mirror. There's a reason why your windscreen, why your windshield is much larger than your rear view mirror. For you are supposed to be moving forward, not backward. That's the direction you're supposed to be moving in. Let me help you get it. Yes, we're supposed to learn from where we've come from, but don't be so stuck in the past that you fail to move forward. David saw the T-I-S in his rear view mirror. Uh, what was his T-I-S? I'm so glad that you asked. T is for transgression, I is for iniquity, and S is for sin. David takes his T-I-S, his tis, but he's not looking backwards anymore. He's moving forward. Tis. So sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thus, saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Don't succumb to the paralysis of analysis. When God has already forgiven you, don't be burdened by your transgression. Don't be crippled by your iniquity. Don't be paralyzed by your sin, but you can take your T-I-S, your tis, and like David, know tis, the blessed hour of prayer. You can take that tis and know tis, love that makes us happy. You can take that tis and no tis almost time for the Lord to come and so when Satan reminds you of your past you can remind him of his future the devil's just mad because he knows he doesn't have a future and that's why Revelation 12 verse 12 reports he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short that's why he's so mad that's why he's so busy he's going about like a noisy lion because he knows he doesn't have a future but he also knows that in Christ you do I've said it before let me say it again every saint has a past but every sinner has a future. David, fueled by faith and propelled by prayer, descended down the other side of the Mount of Olives. He knows who he is in relation to who God is. And this understanding of who God is and what God has done has instilled in him a spirit of humility. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said of his arrogant son, Absalom. Absalom had a spirit of pride and lust for power. Whilst David reflected Jesus's spirit of humility, Absalom exhibited Satan's spirit of craving and coveting authority and superiority. Satan had said in Isaiah 14 verses 13 and 14, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Just like Satan, Absalom was only interested in his own will, not God's will. But the devilish comparisons do not stop there. For Absalom not only aimed to attain his father's throne, but he had already shown through his actions how he had assumed the position of God. And someone did something that Absalom did not like. He not only got mad, he got even. Absalom's inclination to get revenge is in opposition to God's word. For God has declared in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35, and Romans chapter 12, verse 19, vengeance is mine. And so by taking vengeance on somebody who has wronged you, you have put yourself in the place of God. You have robbed God of his prerogative, for you have taken that which does not belong to you. 
the humility of David and the change in David is seen in his willingness to lead his troops out in battle against this revolt of Absalom. David says in 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse number three, I myself will also go out with you. But David's men reply in verse four, you shall not go out. For if we flee, they will not care about us. If half of us die, they will not care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, it is better that you send us help from the city. In other words, if the king dies, it's over. They will have nothing and no one to fight for. David was already well into his 60s, but he was willing to go into battle, not because of pride, but to stand alongside his men. Absalom had the larger army, but David had military strategy. He split his smaller army into even smaller divisions, the first contingent under the command of Joab, a second unit under the order of Abishai, and a third regiment under the responsibility of Ittai. David did not want to fight against his son, but Absalom had left him with no choice. Absalom's rebellion and insurrection had put David's kingship into question. This was to be Israel's civil war, son against father, the proud against the humble, the challenger of Israel versus the champion of Israel. David was well protected within the walls of Mahanaim. Mahanaim was a strongly fortified city in Gilead. It was surrounded by mountains and the country itself had enough provisions to make this the perfect place to retreat in case the battle did not go as planned. The people were not only friendly, but supportive to David's cause. From the walls of the city, David could see Absalom's vast army. This was the official army of Israel. And so the Bible refers to them as the men of Israel. David's company was only a handful in comparison, but little is much when God is in it. Uh, let me help you get it. If God could use a small staff to make a highway through the Red Sea, if God could use a small jawbone to annihilate 1,000 Philistines, if God could use a small stone to beat and defeat a Philistine giant, if God could use a small lunch to provide an all-you-can-eat for a crowd of more than 5,000, surely God can use these few but faithful men. David would not wait for the men of Israel to attack, but he would send his armies out. As each contingent, unit, and regiment file out of the fortified city of Mahanaim, David gives his commanders a message. He could have commanded them to make sure that Absalom is killed. But even though the king has been dreadfully wronged, he wants Absalom to live. The king wants his relationship with his child to be restored. He wants to be reconciled with the one whom he loves. He wants to repair the damage that has been done. And so 2 Samuel 18 verse 5 records, and the king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, uh, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. David's men had fought in open combat against the long lines and superior numbers of the men of Israel. They surely would be defeated, but they've been instructed and directed to go into the forest of Ephraim. Engaging the enemy in the forest would mean that Absalom's numbers would count for nothing. And David's army could play hide and seek using tactics of hit and run. This was guerrilla warfare. As Absalom saw David's army running into the forest, he thought that this was some kind of retreat, that they were running scared. The forest seemed to look like a position of weakness, but little did Absalom know that this was the scene of victory. The second Samuel chapter 18 verses seven and eight records, and the men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David. And the loss there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. 
seeing now that he is defeated, Absalom convinces himself that this is not the time to fight, but the time for flight. Verse 9 reports, and Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. Don't miss the irony. This hair which Absalom cut only once a year, this hair which he immensely and excessively cherished, this hair which he bragged about was a symbol of his pride. And it's because of this pride that Absalom gets caught up and held up by his lovely locks in that tree. He's in a vulnerable and uncompromising position suspended, the Bible says, between heaven and earth. A soldier of David sees him and hastily hurries to notify Joab. What does Joab do? Verse 14 of 2 Samuel 18 informs us. And he took three javelins in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak. We don't know why Joab needed to pierce the heart of Absalom three times, but this was not yet the end of Absalom. Verse 15 continues, and 10 young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Verse 17 says, and they took Absalom and cast him into a great pit in the wood, the enemy of the king, who had rebelled against the king, who had led many of the king's people away and astray, ends up in a pit. When Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future, for there is a bottomless pit awaiting him. The news of Absalom's demise reaches King David. Uh, David starts shaking and trembling. He's overcome with emotion and grief. The Bible records and reports, and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The cry of David is painfully profound, for it is recorded in a chiastic structure with the central point being that this king would rather die for his child, even though this child was in open rebellion against him. There David mourns, weeping and, willing, weeping and wailing over the gate, suspended between heaven and earth. Could it be that he remembered his own words of judgment to Nathan the prophet after his sin with Bathsheba, that his sin would be restored fourfold? David and Bathsheba's baby had died. Amnon had died. Absalom is now dead. Three down, one to go. The death of Absalom was both an act of justice and mercy. Justice because of David's sin, but mercy because the rebellion against David was over and his throne was now fully established. The Davidic covenant would be realized for Jesus Christ would come as the son and seed of David because of our rebellion. Absalom was known for his beauty, but Isaiah 53 verse two reports that Jesus, when he came to this earth, would have no form or comeliness, that there would be no beauty that he, we should desire in him. Whilst Absalom was physically unblemished from the sole of his feet, to the crown of his head, Jesus was the unblemished son and spotless lamb of the father. Whilst Absalom lusted after the throne, Jesus left his throne. Whilst Absalom sought death, Jesus brought life. And whilst the people's love for Absalom resulted in rebellion to David, his father, our love for the son, Jesus Christ, results in reconciliation with God, our father. Like like David, Jesus left his throne because of a rebellion. Like David, Jesus made himself of no reputation and took the form of a servant. Like David, Jesus refused to enlist military might. For David, it was Ittai and the Gittites. For Jesus, it was the angelic host of heaven. For one song says he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set himself free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Jesus 
had made his way up the Mount of Olives, not only weeping over Jerusalem, but praying for you and me. And so he made his way up Mount Calvary, suffering the slander of the enemy, even though he had done nothing but to help and to bless, he humbly endured the ridicule of the crowd and the thrown stones of his opponents. They finally nailed him to the tree. And as he was hoisted up, suspended between heaven and earth. It seemed like Jesus was in a position of weakness, but little did the enemy know that this was the scene of victory. You've heard it said that if the king dies, it's over. We'd be fighting for nothing. But I'm glad to report to you this morning that our warfare is not in vain, that our welfare is in the king's hands. And because it is, I would like to invite you to join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you that he was treated as we deserve, that we may be treated as he deserves. We confess today that we've been like Absalom, We've been inclined to be bitter rather than to do better. We've held on to grudges for far too long. We've been tempted to think that we are deserving of much more than we already have. Forgive us, Heavenly Father. We've seen the sacrifice you have made through Jesus Christ, your son. We've seen the pain that you've endured on our behalf. We feel the repercussions of our rebellion and ask now, dear Lord, that you would purge us with hyssop so that we would be clean and that you would wash us so that we would be whiter than snow. May we experience change, that arrogance would give way to humility, that selfishness would give way to love, and that our inherent wickedness would give way to your divine holiness. So live out your life within us, O oh Jesus, King of kings. Be thou thyself the answer to all our questionings. Live out thy life within us. In all things have thy way. We, the transparent medium, your glory to display. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.